All righty. Yep, we are we are live and recording. So introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you know and why you know it, and then let's dig into fantasy and biology and where they intersect. Oh, hold on. Looks like my audio is not capturing. Hold on. Before you go any further, I don't want to screw this up because your lecture is excellent and I don't want to miss it. Where? What's going on here, audio? What have you done to me? I'm so sorry, guys. I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. Yeah, exactly. It's it's betrayed me. Uh, and I'm very upset. I'm sorry, Lee. Give me just a second. This was working. Uh, you can talk, but... I'm trying to figure out what's going on. No, yeah, your inter your internet is fine. Uh, let's see. Yeah, usually your internet's acting up, but this time, no, it's me. Let's try it. Say something. Hello. There we go. There we go. We got you back. Okay. All right, Please continue. Let's start. Start over. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Leeds, and I am a molecular biologist. And today, I will be talking about how to apply biology in fantasy, and a little bit in. Also, we explore a little bit of sci-fi, but our main focus will be fantasy. So, for starters, uh, there is one main rule you must consider when applying biology to your fantasy world that you are writing fiction. That's the most important rule. You are writing fiction. And you should not just rush into the deeps of biology and try to explain everything biologically. That's not a proper way to do it. Mm -hmm. You will sometimes, in fact, most of the time, just make everything worse. Or extremely for confusing. Example, exactly. If you want to put dragons in your story, for example, just say there are dragons in your story. They breathe fire, they're big, and that's it. Nobody will question it. Similarly, mm -hmm. if you want to put a cat bus and weird talking mushrooms, go ahead. Nobody's going to question it. In fact, people just love it and adore it for your mm -hmm. crazy creativeness. Definitely. And, however, if you really want to get into the biology of your world building and say make it more hard as sci-fi terms suggest, because you also want a more realistic approach to it, then you must consider a lot of things when doing so. And one of them, as I stated, how much depth is necessary in your world building. Because yep. there is a thing with explaining biology and science of the world in general is that there's an uncanny valley that yep. if you don't explain enough, people will just say, okay, this is bullshit. This is how it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. What are, what are the authors talking about? That's not how stuff works. One of the main examples of this is that there was a science fiction show called Fringe. And uh, yep, Fringe, science yeah. In it was, yeah, science in it was just bullshit, and people mostly just, what the fuck? <laughs> I will admit that I liked the show, but I didn't really pay attention to the science. I'm not yeah, a scientist either, uh, so yeah. I just like and the yeah, plot. Is the great example of what not to do with biology. You have force, do not explain it. Do not explain yep. the science behind it. You don't need to do it. Yeah, you, you, the midichlorians thing was unhelpful. It's space magic, yes, leave it alone. Exactly. Um, for, I'm a, but you can't 
explain some of how it works. Like, for example, how to train your dragon has various kinds of dragons. And yes, mm -hmm. we will be talking a lot of dragons in this lecture. And I'm all about dragons. They say, okay, they say that this dragon has this, this dragon has that, this does this and this acts like this. Okay, these are enough information, just enough information that how these animals are or creatures or monsters separate mm -hmm. from others. You can right, say so that. Yeah, it's it's a bunch They're... of different like species of dragon, and they talk about the differences between them, but they don't really get into like all of the science of exactly how those things are done in their bodies. Exactly, exactly. They they just are okay. This is a creature with this quirk. That's it. Yep. Because which makes perfect sense. In biology, in biology, in realistic biology, you have to consider a lot of things. And there is the it gets so complicated that even I can just write it off. Yep. In fact, I don't have enough knowledge to write about rodents, which I have taken a class on how to handle them and get right. a certificate. But then I had no idea how to write rodents, so I had to do a lot of research mm -hmm. just to work with a single species. Right, if you're going to get and super in-depth, this, in this, uh, this brings us to the second part of our rules, is that you need to do research and do a lot of it if you want properly designed and yep. biologically accurate animals. And, yeah, you have to it, understand evolution, you have to understand biomechanics, you have to understand how ecology works. Mm -hmm. A lot of things, and in most of the cases, square cube love will be a pain in the ass. <laughs> Definitely. All, it will ruin everything you want to do, and evolution. Because, oh boy, you are not going to have four-limbed creatures, six-limbed creatures, and eight-limbed creatures all as vertebrates, because that's not how it works in our world. One of approach we could follow is that, okay, we have a fantasy world, everything's evolved from some ancestors, and we have dragons in it. Yeah. You know, the six limbed dragons yep. that has four legs and two wings. Okay, that's fine. What to do now? Make them small. That's one thing you have to do, otherwise they can't fly. Right. Then, you also have to consider, okay, we have all these fantasy races and whatnot oh and yeah creatures they should all be six limbed as well yep you have to do that and if you do that that's a great application of biology to world building and fantasy Which Same goes for could be a lot of fun and alien, alien biomes mm -hmm. and in this case you can look up examples from speculative zoology it's science that um, and speculates that how would some animals have evolved or will, will evolve there are various kinds of them and for an entry there is an, a documentary by discovery I, if I remember correctly called the future is wild oh yes I loved that it was so much fun yeah, you can watch them and get an idea how things are done. Then there are a bunch of books and articles that mm -hmm. you can read about it. And they, they are, of course, more scientific in their, in their approach. And you can just pull up a dinosauroid. I remember that abomination and scientific community just roasted it <laughs> to oblivion. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, the I, I've seen a lot of uh, Anne McCaffrey when she did her dragons. Um, she didn't. She explained them a little bit. She said, had there be little ones on the planet that were the progenitors of the big ones on the planet, and in order to breathe fire, they had to chew a certain kind of rock that went into the second stomach and produced this gas and so on. But she didn't get super scientific about it. But she was primarily a yeah. sci-fi writer, so it was she kind of yeah. rode that yeah. line. That I would call just not very scientifically accurate because animals cannot breathe fire the closest you can get right. is 
bombardier beetle and their burning chemical spray. Yeah. Well, of course, it's what not real you... science, but it's, you know, it was good enough for the sci-fi fans. Yeah. I would rather say that Dragon's Breed 5, the end. Yeah. I, because I get jarred when people try to explain how Dragon's Breed 5. Mm -hmm. However, you can do old dragons, old Norse dragons that they don't breathe fire, but they spit venom. Right. Mm -hmm. that, and which is absolutely biologically logical because it happens. Yeah, it happens. There are a lot of animals that spit stuff. Some spit blood from their eyes. There's a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lizards. Reptile, the lizard, the lizard that spit blood from its sides. Yeah, some snakes spit. Yes, yeah, spitting cobra is mm -hmm. very famous for it. Uh, there's archer fish. Which yeah. Uses water as a weapon. Yeah, archer look fish up, are fascinating. As I said, research is very important, and you can look up a lot of animals and get an idea how to create. Yep. Your own versions of fantasy yep. creatures, whatever you want to write. Mant uh, mantis shrimp are another interesting one, too. Yeah. Or uh, the... It, it, it was the pistol shrimp that... Yeah, the pistol shrimp. Them. That's the one I was thinking of, yeah. So, yeah, there are a lot of really fascinating creatures. If you really want to go into the science, you can learn a lot from creatures that exist out there and kind of appropriate pieces of their biology to make it more scientifically accurate. Now let's talk about my favorite topic in fantasy creatures. It's chimeras. Yum. There are various kinds of chimeras in fiction that range from minotaurs to actual mythological chimera that has a bunch of weird stuff attached together to a dog and a girl mixed together. Yep. That one is actually the on the more scientific parts and realistic parts. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I got In that reality, reference. I think we all did. Yeah, I'm going to make you upset and whoever got this rep reference upsets. I will do that. <laughs> Again, you can, there are three types of timers in my book that Realistic chimeras, stuff that you can plot somewhat believably and say, okay, these exist, they might be considered scientific. Mythological chimeras that are, as I said, bunch of animals bunched together, sewn together, like the actual chimera that has a snake tail, lion body. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. A goat. And there are scientific chimeras, which is which are actually very boring. That okay, you have two different kind of cells in your body because your yep. TV fuse with you or your mutation. Yeah, I have a. I had, yep, I had a cat who was a chimera. She was a, a fusion of two embryos in the womb, and half of her was black and half of her was orange. It was and really they, interesting. Uh, actually, you're talking about calico cats, and they are not technically chimeras. Well, she was. Mom. She specifically was a chimera because they tested her, so... Okay, it can be, because orange and black cats are a condition called calico, and it's more about X chromosome inactivation. Mm-hmm. We are not yeah. going to talk about it, unless you want to, after... Yeah, uh, that's fine. Tomorrow, actually. <laughs> I can talk about them, but yeah, they're not really chimeras. So you can pick, I don't suggest you should pick the scientific ones because again, as I said, they're just boring. And unless you're writing a weird quirky character that happens to be a chimera and has a weird coloration, like the one you said, Mm -hmm. they, they are not going to interest the reader as much. You you can pull out a realistic chimera. These ones can range from werewolves, not the ones that transform into werewolf, but rather they're werewolves all the time. Mm -hmm. To setters, actually, setters are kind of realistic. You can pull it out, and they say they 
evolved from this way and they end up with hooves on the fur above their bodies. Yet you can pull it out and it's not really unscientific. What is unscientific, however, is cat centaurs. <laughs> they are not going to work. No, you're they not don't going work. To science, you're not going to science centers into existence. You, you cannot apply science to them. They don't break every conventional biology, all of it. Just yeah, they, they, they don't make if any want, sense if you think about it. Yeah. There are so many problems. If I begin to list it here, we will be here all day. But if <laughs> you want centers in your story, just put the they say, okay, there are centers. The end. Nobody is yep. going to question it. Now, speaking of verbals, I also want to talk about anthropomorphization. Yes, the, these animals are fantasy creatures because they are not real animals. Uh, uh, Aurora or member here actually knows much better about how to write anthropomorphic characters but i will talk about the biology of it so he can add if he wants to okay wonderful so anthropomorphization has various degrees that can range from guy with cat ears to talking animals to a, actually animals with slightly more intelligence than they should have kind of thing like velociraptors in jurassic park yep or yeah, the, some uh... dogs films that dogs do stuff the dogs shouldn't do like watership talking down kind animals. of thing no uh, no they're talking animals actually disney animal company yeah exactly these okay, are actually gotcha. more more Animals that are intelligent, more intelligent than they should, be, they should be. Gotcha. So in this case, if you want to do animals that are slightly more intelligent, they, they, they are scientific enough. You can say they, this story is fantasy, so they can do that. We know animals that appear very dumb and they don't know, not very intelligent, such as sharks or like they are way more intelligent than people give credit them or they can recognize people they can get attached to people and they are just sea puppies they are not these very and this crisis exists to end and and where to do research uh, okay this depends on how much science you want to put into your book like you can have magic systems that are hard you can magic systems that are soft you can magic them that are in between it's the same story if you want artfully defines animals and creatures or what uh, whatever you decide it mm -hmm. but the moment you decide it you need to decide how much should i explain and if the explanation requires some scientific knowledge you should go in-depth research. And in-depth research, I mean very in-depth research, just to be safe. For example, I researched a lot of rodent facts when writing my book that will never make into the story. But mm -hmm. I just did because uh, they might be useful in my made one of which included that how long does copulation last in mice and rats and squirrels? Mm -hmm. So I think the key here is, uh, to some extent, forgive me for cutting in, to some extent is include the parts that are important to the story. If it's not important to the story, don't worry about it. I mean, um, I know that you're not a fan of Anne McCaffrey's explaining the breathing of fire, but you could go that route and people will kind of accept it since they go into it knowing it's a sci-fi or a fantasy. So... It, you can kind of ride the line a little bit. What I say is that it's like deep world building. People won't see 99% of your research, and it's fine. Same mm -hmm. goes with the depths of your world building. People, 99% of it will not be shown to the 
people your cannot put it on the page unless you want to turn your vision a 1500 biology lecture right <laughs> which is not really going to keep readers because that's not what they bought your book for yeah so you know do your research as long as you, you say okay i need these parts and these parts need to be consistent mm -hmm. because if things are inconsistent it's rule of all kind of word building that everything breaks apart yep. consistency is the key and absolutely you should also know where to stop doing research for example i really don't need to know <laughs> go on i i'm laughing because uh i stopping doing research are you kidding me hmm. like i should have i don't need to know that Apodemus sylvaticus spermatozoa that form sperm trains via attaching themselves through molecular hooks. Yeah, this is unnecessary information. I just <laughs> researched. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we are scientific here, so it's safe for work. No, it, it, no, no, it's correct. Yes. I just made a stupid yeah, pun. My work. We write articles about it. In fact, I read it on an article and evolutionary advantages of it. Mm -hmm. In my world of anthropomorphic creatures that work, walk upright, use tools and wear clothes, that kind of adaptation is not going to exist because they, their species don't work like real life at Apodemus sylvaticus that they don't they are monogamous essentially so they're not going they shouldn't have those but they have because why not nobody's going to know about it so i can i put it yep and you're going to be consistent about it which is really the thing like part of the yeah. part of the uh, magic of doing this is that if you add things that make sense to folks you know in a scientific way at least a little bit that means that the things that don't, they give you more space for. Like for when I'm working with a, sci a, um, a client who's doing a book on history, if they get things right for the most part, they can choose the points where they're not going to be historically accurate. And that leap feels like it makes sense in the setting in the world, even if it's not real. And that's kind of where you want to hit is you want to make sure that you have enough that people will follow you into the magical realm, so to speak. But you don't need to bog yourself down too bad in the science either. But research it so you understand yeah. it and can make choices. As long as you get out of that the uncanny valley of explanation, you are fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just don't get in there. And it's tricky to know when to know if you're there or not. Mm. Yeah, it can be a challenge because... Knowing how much information is too much. I'm yeah. trying to read the chat. Uh, can you read the chat for me? And uh, let's see. Like, um, any questions? So far, because... there. I think they're just currently they're having a conversation about cubic poop. So I'm not sure that's relevant to what you're discussing. Oh, yeah. um, somebody was talking about uh, interbreeding. Um, like you and I had that conversation about elves and fae and humans and interbreeding and how they shouldn't yes. be able to since they're technically distinct species. But you know that that's yes. a very um, oh goodness. I am, um, okay. I was going to talk about it later, but since we uh, the topic came to me, I'm going to talk it right now. Yeah, that's the thing. If you want to be scientific about your races, even though they just look like humans with pointy ears, if they live thousands of years and your humans live eight years, normal human years, they, they are different species at this point. Mm -hmm. So they should not be able to make and produce fertile offspring. Yeah. So half elves would be sterile, you may... technically. Sort of like uh, yeah. ligers and such. Yeah. You, you may get away with half elves that are sterile, but there's also the thing that we don't get, we are not attracted to different species at all, mm -hmm. very much. There, for example, Coyotes and wolves can actually breed 
and produce fertile offspring, but in the wild, wolves will usually kill coyotes. Mm -hmm. So, so they're already rare, and if the animals are, if the races are sentient, you can justify that they are more civilized and just do it for the funsies, yep. or they are birds. That's also another explanation, but dragonborns or Argonian or hybrids or whatever, yeah, yeah, they are not scientific. They are not going to no, work not biologically. All. You can have them. It's fantasy. You can have those, but they are not just very realistic. Right. It works for Tolkien, for example, because his world is mythological and created not stuff are not evolved or biology isn't there so mm -hmm. it works for him but most stories don't work like that dnd is one of them yep yeah dnd so is fine with that... interbreeding um yeah, and my books but allow it for it too it shouldn't, be. it shouldn't be in my opinion because well, I, I'm going with it I just because say... it's cool. So that's my explanation is it's cool. Yeah, cool. That's also one of the things like if you want, it's cool. Okay, do it. It's fantasy. Mm -hmm. In the end, yeah. it just comes to taste. I don't start like interbreeding of species. And in fact, I consider it bestiality in my book, but... If you want to have it, yeah, most people will be fine with it. Some people won't be fine with it, like me, but it's not going to affect you that much. No, it shouldn't. And generally speaking, like, it depends, because for me, it's, uh, like, you'll have, like, orcs and elves interbreeding. They're humanoid, and so it's it's close enough, really. Um, yeah, but if we are doing it with aliens, I will come to you and will punch you with a beaker. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair, and I accept that. <laughs> no Mass Effect bullshit. I don't, I don't <laughs> care. You do not pull Mass Effect bullshit. And You're lucky biology. Heather's not here this week. <laughs> I don't know what she does. I, doesn't she just have undead? Uh, no, she, but she's a, she's a huge fan of Mass Effect. Is, is what it is. <laughs> You'd be starting a fight. <laughs> At least Interbreed Reaper said tentacles. Oh, no. Oh, we don't need to have Heather here for it to devolve into naughtiness. So, let's talk about how the biology of the species races would affect culture. Because that's one of the things in my book focused on. Yet, how these species and their behaviors would affect their culture. Now, my world, um, can I talk about it? Yeah, I don't absolutely. Know just blatant marketing and whatnot, but basically, I used speech, my speeches are all mice and weasels and stoats, and all of them are different species, so they cannot interbreed as well. But I also gave them different languages because it's realistic humans in different places, they have different um, languages, so they should be. But since I cannot create 80 Hong Langs, I just ripped off real life languages. That's it. I am really sad about it. I should be able to world build them, but... Unlanging is cultures, actually really hard. Yes. Um... If I could probably do one Hong Lang, but 80... Yeah, so that's a lot. Even, no, no, I can, I I I know my limits. As well, you should, because conlang is it's and, it's almost like biology in its own way, except linguistics. And since I use those real life languages and names, people might feel and might assume that I also ripped off the cultures and whatnot. But I I actually didn't. I world built the cultures based on behavior of the animals. Which is fantastic, for example, honestly. My, for example, my squirrels don't grow wheat. They don't harvest grain. They don't do that. They instead have little orchards. They grow nut trees and they grow various kinds of egg 
not seeds, whatever you call it. And Italians don't do that. They used to be Italian, but they don't do that. No, they, they grow pasta right out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I am French speaking most that have an under kingdom that goes way beyond in deep dark tunnels that there's no light or anything and therefore they don't also wear very bright colored clothing their clothing is just whatever the natural color of the fabrics they use so unlike french nobility in medi medieval periods and middle ages they have very fancy colorful clothing my molds you know they they are just very blind because they're blind they can see Right, they don't worry and about color. They might. I think they'd worry more about texture. Texture and smell. Smell is also yep. important. And I also use it in in dialogue as well, and others that affect language. So, it, Mike would not see say that I see or long time no see. No, he 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 or she will use smell or hearing. They they are the yep. things they see the world with they don't just use their eyes in fact mites and rats are extremely myopic that they just see blurry images of the world they mm -hmm. feel the world with their whiskers they smell it in 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 fact dogs also see the world with their noses and there was a thing in world war ii called russian anti-tank dogs that the russian strikes using dogs with bomb vests to blow up German tanks, but the thing is, they trained the dogs with Russian tanks, and they smelled of diesel. Okay. So it's sort German of like bomb tanks, smith, sniffing dogs in reverse, German, sort of. German tanks used regular gasoline, so... Oh, so it would work. For a, dog, for a dog, German tank was not a tank. It was a Russian tank that smelled of diesel. But a tank, That's so fascinating. they blew up their own tanks. So you may use that in your world building. They say that these fantasy rays use their nose, so they see the world completely differently. Mm -hmm. for, for example, there was this creature in Avatar The Last Airbender that, that this headhunter was using. Oh, yes. Used... I don't remember. A uh, shear shoe, the... I think it was called. A shear shoe. Yeah. For example, that, was, that thing was blind, and they beat it by throwing some perfume. Mm -hmm. Very clever use of biology and world building that. Yep. Similarly, badger moths and they're sensing the world through vibrations. Mm -hmm. That was very clever too. Avatar has very good world building and they yeah. also apply to the biology. Yes, sure, they have dragons that fire breathe fire without no explanation flying giant bison with no explanation mm -hmm. yet yeah, that's that's fine they're flying. like they didn't explain fact, everything most... but the things they did explain yeah. made sense yes for example the all weird combination animals aren't really not scientific at all because they, they make no sense as i said they are on the more crazy side of chimeras mm -hmm. but it, it everything was chimeras that work like that so it, it's fine they just yep. applying of those chimeras unique traits to world building yeah the bear that was yeah, just a bear was so weird yes that was again very clever when you have everything but the chimera and normal bear would sound weird yep yeah it was and excellent that's... world building Let's see what should I say. <laughs> don't go into molecular biology and things like that. You don't need to. I am a molecular biologist, and molecular biology led to me me to sperm hooks and trains. Just don't. Yeah. So. So how. For for sci-fi and fantasy, how would somebody who's not a scientist go about researching things that, 
will help them create a more logical and scientific basis for their world, but not overwhelm them. Is there, do you have any suggestions for that? Kurzgesagt is a great starting point. There are also a lot of popular science books that talk about stuff in more simplified manner. But if you really want to go into hard science of it, you have to read articles and scientific books. Sorry, that's how things are. You can't write a book that is set in medieval France, 13th century France, for example, and keep it historically accurate without reading yeah. actual history. Right. So you have to. that's the ugly part of it. But you can get away with a lot of stuff just through popular science books that and videos that explain stuff in a very understandable manner for people that have no information or knowledge or anything about that. So things like yeah. Discovery Channel type of stuff would be yes. a, a good starting place. Yes, of course. Documentaries Wonder. are, again, popular science, not super okay. detailed science because Real science is kind of boring for unless you're really interested in it. Uh, yeah. I, I find real science fascinating, but I find the, a lot of the presentation to be mind-numbing because they don't present it or share it in a way that's accessible to folks who are not in that community a lot of the time. Um, there is actually a site called SciHub uh, that has free articles. Sci-hub? Kind of like can, you, can you type that in the chat it. so that we can spell it? Sorry, I, I don't mean to break your stride. Just typing it out so that people can find it would be great. I will try to... Thank you. Oh, uh, Nidnid got it for you. Oh. Yep, looks and like Nidnid this... found it. And there's a... Uh, uh, okay. Is... Okay, I've tried to share the link to the site. Yep. And basically, you can access every article for free using that site. I also use it because, yeah, I'm not going to pay money to read an article to write my own research, even though I am currently unemployed. But I used right. to write a lot of papers back in university, and mm -hmm. I had to use articles, a lot of them. And yeah. No, science is boring in a way that you don't spend four hours in a lab doing nothing, waiting for your test to run. Right. Doing it isn't really exciting. Exciting. <laughs> you just pipe it stuff, put it here, put it here, mm -hmm. run it. Oh, it didn't work. Why? Oh, that's why. Let's do it again. Yep. No. Uh, it's. It's not like CSI where it's all, you know, blinking lights and all, everything's analyzed immediately and uh, very fast paced. Yes. That's why I, I want to study with animals, actually, because there, there is more excitement to that. At least there's cuteness. Yes. Anyway, let's see what else we need to talk. Um, Uh, yeah, I was talking about culture building with yes. species. I had no idea why elves live in trees. Like, yeah, I don't. Why elves live in trees? Why elves use bows? Um, I know Tolkien explained it by them having like magically excellent eyesight, which gave them the ability to target at a far longer distance. That's why he did it. The trees thing, I don't know, but. Yes. I that's the explanation for many sci-fi verse, including D and D, if I remember correctly. Yes, that well, they they based a lot of their information out of Tolkien, who is you know. But in reality, using bows isn't about eyesight and more about muscles. Mm -hmm. And as don't look very muscular. If if you want a species that uses bows, that should be orcs. Or look at like Mongols, like look at the societies in the real world who really were bow heavy and yeah. build them yeah. like that. Mongols, Mongol horse archers were still very powerful people. Like they could, mm -hmm. because a Mongol war bow, despite being small, is very powerful. Like, oh yeah, I've I've tried to draw one. Wow, 
45 kilogram ones. Yeah. Some I I remember some reaching a lot 60 kilograms. Mm-hmm. Like they are much mini longbows in draw yeah. power, and you cannot. You're going to draw it while riding a horse. Mm-hmm. A puny elf isn't going to draw one. Right. Um, unless there's magic involved, in which case everything else kind of goes out the window. Because when you say a wizard did it, well. Yeah, if you magic your way into it, yeah, you can say biology. You have right. magic, you can have biology and magic just coexist and because they're contradicted. One, science, right. one is not science. Mm-hmm. I've and been wrestling stuff. with that really hard. Um, in my setting, because I have magical creatures and modern technology kind of up against one another, and they're equal, and trying to figure out where the different delineations lie, because you have modern science in my setting, because it's modern day Boston, so it's it's been hard. Yeah, that's why I don't really go with modern settings when it comes to fantasy, because you have to balance modern science with magic and stuff, and it really doesn't work very well, because for example. Let's say you you have dragons. How are you going to explain dragons with modern science and in the era of genetics and whatnot? Like, right? Yeah, they should not be working properly unless you're doing a kaiju film. Yeah, kaiju film don't have logic. You just see, want to see giant monster beat south. Yeah, and that's completely fine. That's, <laughs> Yeah, like my my setting, I kind I don't really talk about the science so much, um, but I've had to think about it in terms of medicine, like what character, like what characters, what races respond in what ways to what medicine, what kind of unique diseases might a, um, I came up with a unique disease for various different species who have the the sensitivities to like you know can't have until iron or silver or what have you. They all have unique properties to them. And trying to balance that with actual medical science is really hard. I just made it basically an extreme allergy, which works. The thing is, some people debate that immune system is more complicated than human brain. Some say it's the second most complicated thing in our bodies, and some say it's the most complicated thing. So it's okay you don't if you don't have any idea how to write medicine and what stuff like that because immunology is extremely hard it's subject. complicated and even professors with phds only focus on a single area in it yep. and they don't even have full grasp of the whole immunology right like i so, i didn't get too deep into it but i just mentioned that this disease exists because it's relevant to my story i don't explain it too much because that's where it would get really sticky is if i started really trying to make it like super scientific but saying it exists well that's okay again using popular science materials to get a grasp on immunology will be sufficient in most cases yeah i i've got some friends who are medical folks and i've been asking them in fact, you can say that, okay, this fantasy world has this disease and fixed by making a soup using this herb and mushroom. Yep. That will work. Like, nobody is going to mm-hmm. question because in real life, we have those kinds of medicine. Yep. That's mostly placebo, but still works. I mean, some of them are real. Like, uh, using willow bark, it actually does have the, uh, what's it? Um salicylic acid is that the one uh an aspirin i don't know i, I think it's salicylic plant. i in fact, i have no idea how plants plants work i'm not plant <laughs> no i know I, did, I didn't take any plant class in university so i can't say anything about plants but on a similar topic you also know that diets of your fantasy races should be probably be different than humans Mm-hmm. If you have dog people, they should not be eating chocolate. No, definitely not. Or and tomatoes. Therefore they, yeah, therefore they would have different kind of societies. And if we have an explicit carnivore society, let's say orcs are explicit carnivores and they can only eat meat, mm-hmm. would it 
make really sense that they will settle because settling was due to invention of agriculture because yep. you want to grow a field and fields since fields cannot move you have to settle right and then, you can't just follow the creatures as they migrate in order to keep near your food yes, source therefore a more realistic approach to those would be either hunter gatherers or in the basic case scenario, nomads like Mongols or some Native American tribes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. They, they were humans, they were still omnivores, but they mainly lived off of animal husbandry. Yeah, they, they were uh, yeah. gatherers too, like they'd gather what was in season in that region and then move on. Like they did some cultivation, but not on the scale that Europeans did. Yes, in fact, true. As long as you can justify it, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but definitely. You should, you should be able to justify it, and justifying is beyond midichlorians, let's say. Yeah, midichlorians, ugh, let's not even. Um, but justifying it in the same way that, like, Avatar justified things, occasionally they'd throw in, like, the sheer shoe responds to scent, so let's throw it off by some perfume, but little things like that while not explaining uh, turtle ducks at all is sufficient because it means that there's some explanation in the world and we know there is some and the author thought about it but we aren't going to exhaust every possible avenue of explanation because that would be boring to read in, in the end world building through science and biology isn't about what you say and explain but what you don't say and explain basically. That makes perfect sense. Um, we have about the last 10 minutes here. Does anybody have any questions for a lead about any of this or anything you'd like to uh, have addressed that you haven't asked yet? And I, I, and I, I also talked about everything I was planning to talk about anyway. Yeah. Oh, you did so an excellent ahead. job. And I, I really appreciate Thank you, you uh, giving this information because having somebody with your expertise willing to talk about this and being accessible to people is actually a really phenomenal resource. So I'm really grateful for you uh, doing this talk again. And yeah, I mean, maybe, but the, the problem with turtle ducks is because they're reptiles and they're birds and like, One's cold blooded, one's warm blooded, and there's like they don't work. But we're not we're not gonna Where's pull apart the. I mean, yeah, they are, but they're they evolved away from the the split where turtles took. No, scientifically, they're put in the same place as dinosauria. Okay. Bec and the thing is, our classification of animals are two kinds of them: is modern one and Linnaean. I don't know how to pronounce that guy's names who did it in 18th century based on modern animals and since evolution is a thing that screws up all kinds of classifications we try to do because transitional species also a thing yep that's why cladistics and taxonomy is really hard yeah and it would be in the world was that to find a way to tell to the reader that okay all these animals that has mouse in their name are not actually mice they are not related to mice in any shape or form because yeah it was horribly hard yeah to do it and i my what i came to be that is put a section at the beginning before the story started okay here's biology mm -hmm. that's the only thing i could think of it for now we'll see that everybody's deciding we're just evolving to crabs i guess that's the new new plan yeah body <laughs> all of us are going to be crabs no it's yeah. fine it's funny german animal names are really dead uh, yeah i i definitely like thinking about fantasy biology is hard like i definitely 
fall into I have opinions when something just makes absolutely no sense for the setting but also I'm willing to like I'm fine with fire breathing dragons so if finding that line is really challenging and yep. I think exploring what is and isn't possible is a really interesting thought exercise if nothing else and it'll help you get to know your world better Tanya, uh, there isn't any too unbelievable in fantasy. It's just poorly explained stuff that breaks suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my first things I said was the cat bus. Yep. It's not really. It's complete bonkers. Yes. It's the thing that nobody complains about cat bus. Nobody complains about <laughs> Cheshire cat. No. Nobody compl complains about Lovecraftian horrors. Right. We just accept they exist and move on. Right. I mean, I'd complain about a Lovecraftian horror if I found one in my refrigerator, personally, but that's about the only context I'd complain. <laughs> like, somebody did not clean out their leftovers. All right. Well, uh, I think I will wrap it up here since we don't have any more questions. Thank you so much, Lead, having you talk to everybody and give Thank this lecture is always exciting. I'm really glad to have you and you do such an excellent job um, kind of drawing the lines between science and fantasy and making it make sense. So thank you very much. Thank you as well for hosting me. It's yeah, it. always. Uh, I, I love talking to you and I love having you in the group. Um, so I, uh, I will figure out what we're going to do next week. Um, and as, uh, as was asked earlier, this is definitely open to folks who would like to do a talk or have a subject. Um, if you don't want to do a talk, but you have a question or a subject you want talked about, uh, the future discussion sec uh, suggestion channel is open. Please let me know because the more people tell me things that they want to have talked about, the less I'm inclined to talk about marketing. See that? Carrot and stick. <laughs> so, um, I hope you have a wonderful evening, everybody, and thank you again, Lead, and we will talk soon. Have a good night. Get some sleep. <laughs>